Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you, Raj and Panash, and welcome to our guest today in live broadcast and in video replay. Thank you for choosing to join us today. Transference of knowledge is part and parcel of what conservators do in every endeavor. And this takes different forms in the diverse circumstances that we are privileged to work in. Part and parcel also of traditional societies, traditional knowledge transfer is person to person. However, things are changing with the openness of internet, affording even remote members of traditional societies a potential worldview. This talk is also about mentors and mentees. Here is Aishwarya, upcoming generation of heritage professionals. This image is when she was practicing her risk assessment for cultural heritage treasures in one of my workshops in India. She's a star. Transmiss transmission of knowledge about the value of our own and others' cultural heritage, tangible and intangible, begins in young childhood and can be included in school curricula. Here are my children at age five and six on their way with me to Sikkim to work in a remote monastery. My father brought me to museums in New York as a child and then to India in 1970. Here he is with a family of the renowned scholars, Naval and Kalyan Krishna at Banaras Hindu University. What was on the path from 1969 when I worked in archaeological excavations in the Middle East and 1970 in India to a conservation professional. The answer is mentors. And that's what we're talking about, transfer of knowledge. A mentor-mentee relationship is a traditional transfer of knowledge mechanism. One of my early mentors was famous O.P. Agrawal, conservation pioneer in India at the National Museum Laboratories in 1970. He's well published, everybody knows him. And this is the way the laboratory looked there in 1970 when I first visited. It looked like very serious with men wearing suit and ties. It wasn't hands-on conservation as we know it now. Buddhist mentors I met in India continue to provide, inf provide information and inspiration through my 50 years of working in preservation of Buddhist cultural heritage treasures, including the 16th Karmapa, Kamtul Rinpoche, an amazing painter and meditation master, Gelek Rinpoche, who is director of Tibet House, Delhi, when I first met him in 1970. I do love working in monasteries. The more remote and wild, the better. My current work, when I'm not working in museums, because we can't travel, unfortunately, I'm mentoring and also doing treasure caretaker training workshops virtually. Today, we're writing Preservation of Buddhist Monastery Treasure Workbook for our monk and nun treasure caretakers because they can't uh, join our workshops and they have lots of questions. Every day I get so many questions by social media about preservation concerns for monasteries. In terms of transfer of knowledge, this lecture situation appears to be a top-down situation. Here is me at the British Museum, I'm lecturing. But actually it's not because we work closely together, conservators and affiliated professionals. And it's best when we share information freely and don't hold any personal territory. Treasure caretaker training, preservation of monastery treasures is one of the two examples about transfer of knowledge that I'm gonna show you today.
Crimes against cultural heritage treasures harm the history of humanity, the knowledge of civilization, and centuries-old legacies. Looters and antique hunters target historical relics, leaving behind the wreckage of a nation's heritage. In a race against time, treasure caretaker training teams preservation experts with technologically savvy monks and nuns from Buddhist monasteries. Workshop participants learn to create digital inventories of their own monastery's treasures using their smartphones and tablets for description, imaging, and video. With the dramatic and alarming rise in theft from monasteries and museums by looters and antique hunters, proof of ownership is crucial. Risk assessment and disaster mitigation training help each participant to assess risk to the treasures in their own monasteries and to create action plans before disaster strikes. Using their smartphones and tablets, participants learn to conduct and record interviews with elders in their communities. The digital documentation of these living stories ensures the history of monastery treasures will be preserved and shared with future generations. The video is embedded in this um, webinar if you want to watch it later, if we record this, or ask me and I'll send it to you. So in traditional societies, often transmission of knowledge appears as top-down, as in this historic Tanka image of a Buddhist teacher and his students receiving and giving mind transmission. As many of you know, especially our monks and nuns who are with us today, monasteries have a confirmed hierarchy that functions smoothly. But when I'm invited to teach inside a nunnery or monastery, I'm a guest. And I respect and work within, but not an inherent part of the hierarchy. In the many workshops and seminars I offer in monasteries, the deepest learning is not top-down, it's one-to-one. -one. For an example of traditional transfers, transference of knowledge, in one of our pres preservation of monastery treasures workshops, senior monks and 10-year-old monks were in the same afternoon hands-on groups. And they worked together really smoothly. Also in the group were one nun and one senior archivist. They learned from each other as well. When you need affiliated professionals, but there aren't any other conservators present on your site, who do you work with? The sharing of knowledge is with local professionals, local museum directors, curators, researchers, educators, government cultural officials, local risk management and IT experts for all sharing information local police, security, and political contacts, local community leaders, those who serve as cultural caretakers in areas where there are no conservators, and cultural officers from your own embassy or consulate. And I'm a dual citizen, so I have a lot of those. Once we transfer knowledge back and forth, we make lifelong friends, and sometimes the monks and nuns in the monasteries that we do the workshops in come and visit. This is a monk uh, visiting us in Canada. We work with semi-affiliated semi professionals and we all share information. After all, if you're working, you want to share with uh, everything you have to offer with what they're offering, which is great food, tech staff when my Apple computer and technology doesn't work with the local PC, 
taxi drivers, everything. If they ask about our project, we share, and they share their wonderful expertise with us, feeding us, getting us to where we want to go. Treasure caretaker training workshops and published resources for monasteries is ongoing, sharing knowledge. Here's a practical exercise for risks and hazards, the same ones we teach in, uh, that I teach in museums and historical societies in the West. Everybody sharing their information. And the monks and nuns are the best students for this because they're so practical and let's say a risk of fire, everyone has an example from their own monastery or nunnery. This is the best sharing of knowledge. We have sustainable transference of knowledge, so important. This is one of our favorite nuns from Bhutan. And she was our first student in risk assessment in Bhutan in 2005. And now in 2016, she was teaching monks the same and she's still with our project. Emergency planning and disaster mitigation is so important. We have to transfer knowledge and share knowledge about this. So since we're not traveling for workshops to share knowledge, we're publishing our um, resource for monasteries, which a lot of my conservator and um, museum colleagues are really interested in reading. It is in PDF form on our website. This is what it contains. Video interview of elders, text preservation, wall painting preservation, risk assessment, including a chapter on pandemic, all of the risks, light earthquake, water damage, pests, monkeys, risk assessment, human choices. It's all in our resource. That's how we're sharing knowledge these days. Thank you for the funders for allowing us to publish them online. And that's the way we're transferring knowledge during COVID. Briefly, my second project, talking about transference of knowledge, intergenerational, is one in Nova Scotia with a local community. It's a painted room, wall paintings. The thing is that preservation is science. For example, light damage. Whether we're measuring light damage in a monastery or in the painted room in Nova Scotia, we're using the same tools and the same science. So briefly, the Sinclairin is a national historical site and it has these wall paintings in it that were the earliest Masonic paintings in North America, but nobody knew they were there. Actually, it looked like this when I got there. The thing about it that's relating to our topic is that before I began my conservation work, we have the senior carpenter and the junior carpenter. And what they did was to, um, want, they wanted to install an air conditioner. So they tore out an entire wall of the paintings. And there was a historical portrait here. They tore out the wall paintings and tore out this wall and put a big uh, modern air conditioner in. So uh, sometimes um, it's really important to communicate well with your uh, affiliated uh, local craftsmen and affiliated professionals in whatever site you're working in. On this project, we had transference of knowledge with Canadian Conservation Institute, CCI, who provided amazing expertise throughout the project and advised on environmental control issues. Quickly, my comprehensive plan included education for junior conservators and for interns, a lot of outreach on TV and social media, and so much community, commun community engagement. Here I am revealing the portrait and working with a community member who told us the history, her family had lived in that town for such a long time and she shared the history of that building with us, so important. Here's community engagement with the portrait. Everybody loved to stand in front of it and have their picture taken, a selfie. 
and they told us their stories about the building. In summary, transgenerational transfer of skills related to sustainable heritage conservation can happen in Buddhist monasteries and in Nova Scotia projects. For more information about our different projects, please contact me directly. I'd love to talk to you about them and answer your questions. And now we're transferring to our next speaker, our star, a young heritage profession, a young heritage preservation professional who has so much to share already, now and in the future. I hand you over to her. Thank you so much, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us by Nash NGO. And I feel very privileged in sharing this virtual space with none other than Ms. Anne Schaffel, who is a world renowned and Hello. I would also like to thank the facilitator and host of this talk, Mr. Raj. I work conservation laboratories in India. This presentation has been specially put together for students who are eager in making a career in conservation. In general parlance, conservation in India is associated with only wildlife and environmental conservation. A preliminary Google search on the internet on conservation for that reason. For example, this when you type conservation in India, you only get to see results containing about wildlife, energy, water, conservation in India. There's no mention of cultural heritage anywhere. Moving on to the second page, when we talk about the different types across as well. So why are these results distressing? It's because the civilizational identity of India is arguably the most conspicuous amongst all civilizations of the past and its remnants are adorning all corners of the country and is a marker of our identity. And this centuries old heritage requires specialized care and treatment to ensure its longevity for years to come. Therefore, trained in conservation to formulate with international agencies like the ICOMOS and ICROM since the 1970s. One of the reasons for insensitivity and ignorance towards heritage is that very few students take to conservation, professionals in heritage conservation. You can notice this picture, which is of an inscription in Uttarakhand that has been painted yellow by tourists, which is indicative of their insensitivity and ignorance towards heritage. 
Moving on to the dawn of conservation training in India, you can see that the formal training in India began with the setting up of conservation laboratories in different parts of India way back in the 1930s with the laboratory coming up in the Madras Museum in Tamil Nadu. Yeah, sorry for the disturbance. So the early training endeavors, you'll find it really interesting to note that welcomed only science students, especially with chemistry. And to get the desired training in India, it was very tough and the conservators had had to move to overseas to learn specific techniques and get specialized training. The good kid, many organizations and museums, along with private studios and independent practitioners, have come forward in conducting education and training programs in conservation hands-on practical training in workshop mode has gained significant popularity and training is becoming much more and it also focuses on keeping intact the aesthetics of them but also take into consideration the larger context in which they are played like the IGNCA, the ASI, NMI, INTAC, that are offering specialized courses and workshops to train the manpower in the field of conservation. And today, the field of conservation is not only limited to students with science backgrounds, but it has opened its doors to students from all different streams. Also, the field of conservation is seeing a lot of allied fields like preventive conservation, architectural conservation, cultural informatics, management, digital documentation, heritage management, and many such allied fields gaining popularity. Education and training in conservation currently is limited to master's degree, diplomas, postgraduate diploma, certificate courses, and intensive training modules for over a week or 10 days. However, role of and college, that will be executed as well. Now, conservation training facilitated by IGNCA IGNCA has pioneered a PG diploma course in preventive conservation, which deals with on to the students, the, the course modules. In an interesting mix of both lectures and habits, like Mr. Samuel, Mr. Gale, and the students today after having done the course in preventive conservation from IGNCA, are placed as conservation assistants with CSMVS, Mehrangar Museum, and IGNCA. Now, towards the end of my presentation, I would like to raise a few comments rather than questions, which pose as a challenge for our conservators. Conservation work opportunities are abundant in India, yet the number of conservation projects undertaken are minimal on one hand and lack of trained professionals on the other and after having battled with such issues there is lack of maintenance along with negligence of stakeholders after conservation work is completed and i end my presentation with this slide which showcases the plight of a protected rock shelter site in Uttarakhand so that the challenges that were listed in my previous slide for conservators can be related with this. And I'm sure in few years to come, there may hardly be any painted rock painting left to spot in this area for study and for conservation. So thank you so much.
we're looking forward to any questions that you might have. I think no more any question and any doubts for our participant. And thanks, Anna, and thanks, Aishwarya. You are visit and share your knowledge in uh, my organization page. And uh, also, you are a uh, both of us is a very, uh, very well, and you keep and take care. Thanks, thanks, Anna. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Aishwarya.